All right. Can you hear me? Can you see me? I don't know what's going on with the video. How you doing? All right, good. Good, good, good. I was having some issues. And the, uh, what do you call it there? I don't know what was going on with it. See if they go back on. Yeah, hold on one second. What's going on? Back. Okay. Oh, nobody. This is weird. Nothing. Matt, you still there? Okay, perfect. All right. So, can you see and hear me? Just want to double check here because this thing is acting all kinds of crazy. All right, perfect, good, all right. So like I was saying before the whole audio thing, video thing went out, okay, so the, this is the front of the cylinder right here. Okay, cool, awesome, I appreciate that, guys. This right here is where the air gets goes through the intake, uh, through the coolant fins right here, and then you can see back here where they're blocked off. That's the air dam. So the air flows through this way, hits the dam, and gets channeled through these holes right here, which cools the back of the cylinder head, uh, the back of the cylinder, okay? So you wouldn't be able to really put this on backwards. I mean, you could because of the, the bolt pattern. It would let you, but you would have a, a very difficult time is what that is. I need to do stuff. So that's where that would be. So you're going to want to make sure that you always have the opening right there in the front. And also, too, you can put a head gasket on backwards. Make sure you don't um, because you could, you could really blow them out. I mean, it, it, they will fit the other way. And um, what will happen would be the circle right here, it will be offset. So if you put it on there, the circle will actually protrude up this way. And then it would be into the cylinder right here. And um, you don't want that. That can cause the thing to heat up and melt and all that other stuff. And then you get problems. And any of those chips can get into the uh, rings. So you want to make sure you put that on properly. How do you know you get it on properly? Just the um, cylinder bore. You'll have a complete circle with the head gasket. If it's backwards, you'll see it. It'll, um, it'll be onto the, the casting a little bit and then off the casting of the other side. So... That's that's how you can tell if you got the head gasket on backwards. The head gaskets are reusable, so a lot of people are like, oh, why, why, you know, do I have to replace it every time? Nope, um, they are replaceable, uh, reusable, and you can clean them up with a piece of Scotch Brite, make sure they're nice and copper again, and put them back on. They do make a copper seal, so you can put the um, it's like a almost looks like a silicone, but not silicone. It's like a um, almost like a graphite type material, and it comes in a little tube. You put that on there, a little bit, very, very little, and um, it helps seal it. Fine thing is, thank you. Yeah, yep, you could, you could, um, Yeah, you, you want to make sure you rotate them in the proper, the proper, yeah, the head gasket, yeah. Yeah, you can put them on. Sometimes I do it, I'm like, oh, that's backwards, flip it around. Um, and like I said, you can clean them up with Scotch-Brite, make sure they're nice and clean. All three maintenance surfaces, the, the uh, top of the cylinder, both sides of the head gasket, and the uh, head itself. Clean them all up with Scotch-Brite, and then you should be good to go. 
So it'd be, it'd be super cool if you did that. Yep. And then switch them all together. Check them for warping. Um, typically, what makes them warp is excessive heat. What causes excessive heat? Riding the bike in the wrong gear. Um, what do you call it there? Using the engine as a brake going down a hill, which is never a good idea, um, which is what they call engine braking. So what that is, is they leave it in gear, in the wrong gear, and you let off the brake, uh, off the throttle, and the engine's actually holding you back, and you're using the compression to stop you. I don't know why people do that. Um, just get the bike into the right gear and use the brakes like you're supposed to. Um, don't use, don't let the engine do it. And um, it's also not good for the rings. It's premature wear on the rings. And uh, what was I saying? The um, uh, excessive idling. That right there will also cause it to um, heat up. These are air-cooled engines. And air-cooled engines need to be moving. Um, the longer you let them idle, the hotter they're going to get. Um, they just radiate the heat out. Um, just because they're air-cooled doesn't mean they can sit there and idle all day long. They can heat up and they can overheat just idling which is kind of crazy, I know, but it's true. Um, a lot of times it's a two-stroke. People like to spin them up, you know, free spin them. And, um, I mean, you can do that, but there's no real point in just free spinning a motor for no reason. Is the engine? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, engine braking is not something you should put a motor through. Um, it creates a lot of stress on the wrist pin bearing, um, on the piston rings. The engine's trying to move you. It's got it's got a lot of that type of pressure on it already. And when you're using an engine braking, now it's got the it's trying to produce power and stop you or slow you down at the same at the same respect. Engine braking can um, can prematurely wear your rings. And uh, give you some hot spots and overheat. And it can also build up carbon, um, which is another thing. So I, I don't recommend engine braking at all. Um, just ride the bike the way it was intended. And um, you should be fine. Now, I see a lot of people engine braking, especially going downhill. No, I, I, it's kind of one of those things where um, I want to say, like, if I, some people think it's cool. It sounds cool. And it does. It sounds cool, but it's not good for the motor. It's really not. It's premature stress on, on the wrist pin bearing um, and the rings. And especially, you know, if you rode it the regular way, then you wouldn't have to worry about that. It's it's easier to do brakes on a bike than it is a, a, a top end, you know. And it, it's one of um, liquid cooling can idle a lot longer. It would be one of the benefits. So there are a lot of benefits to a liquid cooled over a air cooled. One, the engine runs definitely runs cooler. Okay. A cooler engine is more efficient. Okay. Well, uh, heat makes it efficient, but if it's cooler, it has a denser fuel charge and you get more power, I should say. Um, so you'd get more, a little bit more power just, from the fact that it's, a, it's liquid cooled. Um, liquid cooled has a lot of benefits that air cooled don't. In other words, they have a radiator and a, a cooling fan typically, like on a motorcycle. Um, on a dirt bike, not so much a cooling fan because you have to start to be running. That's why they got the, the thin, the um, plastics are going, you know, they're out like this. And the reason why they're out like this is so when you're going down there, it channels all the air coming into the bike, runs it through the cooling fins, and keeps the bike cool. So there, there's a lot of um, things to that, but if it did, you know, if you could put a radiator or a cooling fan on it, then the bike, when the engine got up to temperature, the fan would kick on, cool the antifreeze, it would pump the cool antifreeze through and shut itself off, you know, the uh, fan would shut itself off, so it goes to a, a temp sensor. Um, it's a great idea. It works wonderful. Um, however, unfortunately, these, these little bikes right here are not like that. Um, they do get hot and, um, it's just, it's, um, it's abu abuse that they don't need to go through. I basically put it that way. It was just, um, especially with a 100. So it's a little guy trying to do big guy work, you know, 
Um, a lot of times we try to, I see people try to get 125 power out of these things. And you can, but it's hard, very hard. So you don't want to, you just don't want to stress them. You know, don't stress them out any more than they are. They're, they're, they're moving you around quite nicely. And, uh, you know, once again, you know, just, just run them the way they're intended. I, I see um, people power shifting. You know, they, oh, I don't want to use the clutch for first gear. And then after that, that's not good either. So when you power shift, you're wearing out your shift forks. Because what happens when you pull that clutch lever in, the clutch literally separates the engine revving, the engine power from the transmission. And it basically lets everything relax. It shifts in smoothly. And then when you release the clutch lever, it sandwiches that clutch together and puts the power back to it. And now it's like, you know, it's all stressed out, you know, and, and let's go. Wiring. How does one know the proper route? It should be pure though. So you put a flag on it and you put front and then another flag on the thing that says back. And then you'd be able to see which way it lines in, which way it lays. And then, you know, always use flags, take pictures, um, use your resources on all that. And like I said, you can literally put a flag on the front in the back, mark one back, mark one front, and then you'll know which way it goes in. Um, and also to a, a middle point. So what I would do before I pulled the harness off, I put a flag on there with an arrow and put tape an arrow to the frame so that you know where the arrow is going to be. Okay, this is exactly the point where my harness was on the bike. This is the back. This is the front. And then I can stop putting the zip ties in and getting it all um, integrated to where it goes. But your cell phone, this thing is probably one of the best tools you'll ever have inside your toolbox. Okay. Um, if someone, you wouldn't be able to install it backwards because your headlight wiring, your gauge wiring. So what I would do is look for your battery terminals because that would be the back. The back wire. So the um, we call it, you got your blue and your brown wire. That's for your brake light switch. Um, that would be in the back. Your um, what do you call it? The, you should have a green and a gray for your directionals. You should have a white and blue um, for your battery. And uh, you see like your white wire that goes up to you on your bike. You'd have a uh, you wouldn't have a volt regulator, but you'd have a diode. So you'd have that the connector that has one one uh, terminal this way and the other one this way. Um, you could be able to do that. So definitely um, look for clues to how the bike would be. You can also, when you're doing it, you can see how the uh, front would curve around the fuel tank. You can look for that too. If they. Exactly. Yes, if they spent more time, um, what do you call it? They're riding correctly plus time wrenching. The more you beat on these bikes, the more you're gonna have to do to them. Um, a lot of times, people go into it, which is what I call a cowboy or a, a knucklehead, is they get on the bike and they just romp it. I mean, just send it, you know, and then they dump the bike. Or, the, or something breaks on the bike, and then they're like, this bike's a piece of junk. No, it wasn't intended to be driven like that. Um, it's a 100, so. Yeah, yeah, it is where the stories are. But, I mean, they do. They, they It's just crazy how some, like, the bikes that I get, I'll literally beat to hell. Uh, and I, I say that. I mean, I, I mean, I have to go through. When I go through a bike, this is what made me the mechanic I am today. Because I get these bikes, and I get them cheap. I mean, I get them stupid cheap. And I have to go through them. I have to, I have to put a lot into them. Just because people drive them ridiculous. I mean, they just 
hammer the piss out of him, excuse the French, and then can't figure out what happened. And the bike sits in back of a shed, sits in a garage, a barn outside and back of the shed. I had one guy had uh, the yellow, my yellow bike. It needed points. He put it, he took the bike apart and wanted to rewire. He needed a headlight too. He was going to rewire the bike for 12 volts. Luckily, he took the bike apart and didn't know what he was doing and left it. And then uh, he had on Craigslist. Man, what? That guy was a jerk to me, man. I'm telling you, was he a jerk? The bike's 100 bucks. No less. That's it. Yeah, okay. That's fine. That's what I knew uh, that's what it was. It said it right there in the ad, so I went and picked it up, you know. I said, just give me the address. I'm going down. I got a hundred bucks for him. So I, I spent a hundred bucks on that bike. And then I, I put the bike in the back of my, I had a Mazda 5 at the time. Drove it back home. And the guy had said to me, he lost all the bolts to the bike. Okay. I, I, it was dark out. It was a hundred dollar bike. You can't go wrong just for parts. I was going to use it for parts. I don't care. Threw it in the back of the bike, at the back of the car. Got the thing home the next day, took it all out, looked it over. He took all the bolts and put it back into all the holes where they came out of. The bike was complete. I, I locked out, knock on wood. And then I had to replace the headlight. It was missing the directionals. And um, it needed tires and I had to put points and stuff like that into it. And then well, those, are, those videos are all on there. And the bike was complete. I was very happy with it. And I'm still riding that bike today. And uh, that's... Going on five years, I think I had that bike for now. And it's been a very reliable bike. Then I decided to take the points out and change it over to uh, CDI. So now the whole bike is CDI, and I love it. Now you just go out there, put gas in it, and boom, lights. Love it. CDI units can be found in 1996 to 2001 KE100s. And I'm in the process of working on building one. So the, um, what do you call it there? Yeah, a kit. Oh, man. God, I am tired. Very, very tired. So, yep, that's pretty cool. Uh, and you know what? I like doing those type of modifications. Now my KD, my KM, my KE, my KV, all those bikes are all CDI. My DS80, my DS100, CDI bikes. Now my, um... My C50 Honda, CDI. My um, KE100, CDI. All my bikes are CDI, all but one. The only bike that I have that's points is my uh, my MT1, the 1972. What change I'm leaving at points? Okay, not in. So what you would do is you would... Um, the operate the operating manual you probably won't find that. Um, if you're looking for a repair manual, I would say the um, you can use the KE100 Chilton manual or the uh, KE100 uh, Climber manual or uh, not Chilton but uh, Climber and Haynes. And uh, same books that I use all apply to yours. The only thing you won't find in there is your high and low range stuff. But um, the Climber one, you will. The Climber one will have the high and low range. That would actually cover your bike. Um, yes, you know, yeah. So that, that's pretty much all you're going to find. Um, I can tell you right now, the high and low range is not shift on the fly. You're supposed to be stopped when you change from high to low. The reason for that, some people tell you you can shift on the fly. Some people tell you you can't. I'm telling you you can't, and here is why. Because the ratio difference between the high and the low is too great, and it will cause grinding. Um, and grinding is definitely not good, and uh, or can cause it to bind up. So um, that bike is designed to you select it before you shift it. So if you want to be in high gear for like regular riding, switch it over to high. If you're going to be climbing or or going through a trail. So what this bike was designed for is was designed for ranches, like on the farm and all that. So if the guys had to go out there and the cat get cattle and all that, they'd put it in low and go through the field creeping so they didn't, you know, make the whole farm go absolutely crazy. 
And then if they had to go down to the store, they take it out to the road, switch it over to high, and then shift it like a regular dirt bike and head on down to the store at 45, 50 miles an hour. So, so that's the difference between the two. The low, and if you put a big sprocket on the back, a 52 um, sprocket, you'll be able to climb the side of a building. That thing would be stupid low. You'd be cranking up the RPM. You'd be in fifth gear and low in the front and the 52 in there, and that thing will probably be doing like 25 miles an hour, and you will be able to climb anything. It'll just go zoop right up without issue, without strain. That thing is sick. Oh. So, anyway, guys, it is 9 o'clock. I'm going to end it here. I want to say once again, thank you guys for hanging out with me on another week. And uh, I really appreciate all your comments and all your uh, subscriptions and just hanging out with me and doing these live chats. It means a lot to me. So, and once again, I just want to say thank you guys. So we are, um, we'll give you guys the stats for this week. You going to say good night? Okay, go for it. Yeah. Say good night. When you say it. All right. I just want to tell them where we're at so they, uh, they know where we're at. Because it doesn't show you guys all that information on there. Andrew, watch out for Andrew. Can I go right there? Yep. So we are at. We are at, oh, stop. We are at 1,192,535 views, which is awesome. Thank you, guys. Oh, yeah. And we what are, about hold on, Andrew. Fitbit steps. No, we're not doing Fitbit steps. We're doing YouTube stuff. Oh. And we are at 5,683 subscribers. Thank you. That is absolutely awesome. I'm very, very very excited about that. Oh, yeah. So we are growing very nicely. So. I have something to tell. What's up? Um, okay. Make sure um to subscribe to my channel, too. Oh, yeah. Yep. We're going to put you up. We're going we're gonna to do a link to yours. We'll do a link to yours. So anyway, guys, I just want to say thank you guys once again. I very much appreciate it. So um, I will talk to you guys later. I'm out. Oh, 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 oh.